Welcome to Studio 58A Live here at the Jamaica Information Service, our discussion program coming to you live on Facebook. I'm your host, Vaughn Davis. Thank you to everyone joining us online, wherever you are around the world. We do appreciate it. And as you watch, remember to send in your questions and comments so we can put them to our guests. And like how we have you, do us a favor now. Share this video with a friend or two or 50 so we can have a nice, lively discussion. Now, Jamaica developed its first national HIV policy in 2005 as part of the country's first HIV AIDS STI strategic plan. The policy has provided the framework for the design, implementation and management of HIV and AIDS interventions, which very broadly sought to promote healthy, life, healthy lifestyle practices, protect the rights of persons living with and affected by HIV and AIDS, reduce stigmatization and discrimination of persons living with HIV and AIDS, and create an enabling environment for improved access to prevention, knowledge, treatment, and support. Now, the National HIV AIDS STI policy is to be revised. Here to talk about why this is happening and the implications of this are, to my right, Ms. Nicola Cousins, who is Technical Officer at the National Family Planning Board, and to her right, Mr. Devon Gabriel, Director of Enabling and Director for Enabling Environment and Human Rights at the National Family Planning Board. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Okay, yes. now, first question is, why revise the plan at this time? What was, the, what was the rationale for revising the National HIV STI plan at this time? If I may um, begin, well, you, the, first, um, draft, the first policy has been in existence since 2005, and the recommendation is mm -hmm. that every policy document is reviewed after five years mm -hmm. as and where necessary. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in addition to that, mm -hmm. the HIV landscape is very, very dynamic, mm -hmm. as you know. So between 2005 and now, a lot has changed. And therefore, we really need a new policy to reflect all those changes. We now have better um, access to treatment, care and support services. Persons living with HIV are living longer because of the availability of those treatments, um, care and support services, mm -hmm. including the antiretroviral medication okay. that allows people to live for a very long time. And with that, with living longer has come additional issues which now need um, to be addressed. These include comorbidities or other illnesses mm -hmm. such as hypertension, diabetes. Plus, um, when we first started the... HIV epidemic had a particular characteristic okay. that has now evolved. Back then, we referred to it as a general, generalized um, epidemic. It is now concentrated where we recognize that particular um, groups within the population are more affected and mm. more vulnerable. Okay. So for these reasons, primarily, we need to revise. So yeah. basically, essentially, you've had new information, new, new things come to coming. light which have basically changed how yeah. you need to approach things. And we also have to Definitely. catch up with the great policies that we've already put in place mm -hmm. since 2005. Uh, our revised policy is long overdue mm -hmm. to match what the government has been doing. Significant progress has, uh, has been made. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had two strategic plans uh, from 2002 to now. Uh, we've had an HIV workplace policy um, that has progressed to a, wi to a white paper and we're now... Um, we're now operationalizing that through Parliament with the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had uh, a policy for schools. We've had various policies as relate to as relates to uh, to training for workers and as in in the prisons. So an HIV policy must be able to bring all of these sets of actions together. You should also articulate what are the programmings and the collective actions that we must take. And it also, as Nicola has rightly said, you must identify the new trends no, and right. the new priorities. 2005. It's a while back. A while back. Yeah. It's time for us to, to yeah. go back um, through, through Cabinet's decision in 2015 to revisit some of these um, new priorities, mm -hmm. to, find, to, to find out through an iterative process, a repetitive participatory process of what, where our community and our people are, mm -hmm. and to produce a document that reflects where we want to go. So what I'm hearing is that it's the focus is on being responsive to the different changes and the new information and the new new, I suppose, the whole intelligence that has emerged since then to know, make yeah, sure we're up to, up, date, up to date and making sure that we have responsive policies yeah. in place. And also we don't fall asleep right? because there are, there are other challenges out right. there. 
um, HIV prevalence of, among some key populations is still something that we, we need to address and mm -hmm. to fix. Okay. Uh, there are also some new areas in terms of treatment and access to treatment that we must also address. Okay. Um, issues of stigma and discrimination Which and how people, how people view persons that are different and things that are different and how they address those actions. Mm -hmm. That is still an issue that has prevented persons from going in getting tested. Right. You seem to be running status, into my next question, which I wanted you to focus in on some yes. of the new areas that have sure. that have come to light, which have which require a little more focus this time around. I mean, stigma, our, our treatment, and talk to me about some of those new areas that the new policy will seek to highlight. Okay, so I will um, probably start off by mentioning the new test and treat policy. Mm -hmm. Previously, you would have had to be you have had to have had a certain CV CD um, for count to be placed on treatment. In 20... Oh, for those who don't understand what CD4, what does that mean? It's, well, the level of um, virus in your body. Okay. So um, we, in, in terms of the Ministry of Health, the recommendation would have been that um, once you your CD4 deteriorated to about 350, mm -hmm. we would have put you on um, ARVs, okay. antiretroviral medication. Okay. However, the new thinking coming out of the research is that the sooner you put persons on treatment, the better. So mm -hmm. now the new policy is test and treat as long as you do the necessary checks to ensure that the person is ready mm -hmm. to adhere to right. the regimen. Okay, because so. once you've started the medication, um, it's recommended that you continue for the rest of your right, life. Right, right, right. Um, you know, taking the medication at a certain time per day and that kind of thing. So That ad comes to mind where the person says take it, take every, it every day, day because day. you want to live every day, Precisely. Right? Okay. And that is part of the, the promotional um, campaign for mm -hmm. that because it is very, very important. And once persons are on treatment, we are, you're less likely to have new infections mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the treatment along with um, other preventative methods so that, such as the use of um, condoms mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, will negate the passing on of the virus. All right. Anything to add, uh, Devon? This policy uh, needs to address no new infections. Mm. We need to reduce new infections. That's one. Mm -hmm. um, that's a significant priority for our country in which we create a space in which persons are able to dialogue, access care, but we also decrease the fear around HIV and AIDS to the point where persons are willing to take the preventative steps and measures uh, to know their status, et cetera, and to be able to promote information and education and access for everyone. Mm -hmm. So we actually will, will see a reduction in new infections. So that is the thrust of the policy. The policy also has to strengthen the links between the various multiple areas of development. Mm. We always remind people that HIV and AIDS is not only a health concern, it is a development concern. So we must be able to strengthen those linkages. One of those particular linkages is with social protection frameworks. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we make other services available? You see, living with HIV is not an issue of taking medications alone. Right, right, right. It also means that there were it it simply exposes certain risks and vulnerabilities that may have existed before exposure mm -hmm. and are continuing after. Mm -hmm. So that's one. We must address those risks and vulnerabilities. It could be poverty, it could be a lack of education, socioeconomic needs. So we must be able way to ameliorate those risks. Another area of certainly another platform that must be addressed is is the our legislations and policies. Mm. I was I was going to say punitive legislations and policies, but we as a government don't punish people. But we certainly must look at ways in which we can promote universal access. Right. Okay. Uh, yes. In which we must also remind persons who have a responsibility to provide service in a respectful, right. dignified, with integrity. Which brings in the issue of held, stigma yet yes, again. Are right. held accountable. Mm -hmm. We must also create an environment through our policy that promotes certain principles and values as a society. Mm -hmm. One of them is that we will, not we will not promote persons' fundamental rights being breached. Mm -hmm. So we must look at areas of privacy, 
issues of confidentiality, mm -hmm. of the relation of your duty to care, right, all right, of those right, things. Because right. I was about to ask yes. you if stigma is really still a major issue for persons living with HIV, AIDS, STIs, that kind of, is, is it something that they still have to, a big hurdle in 2018 that they still have to overcome let, let each and every day? Let me take that question by saying that it was very refreshing um, to have the, we've had so far in this process, uh, rounds of public consultations mm -hmm. but there have been two particular rounds that i uh, that i want to mention uh we did one was it 2016 nicola yes that was 2016. yes mm -hmm. um in which we to help formulate the situational analysis for mm -hmm. this and persons or community as a whole have shifted in their understanding of what hiv is their willingness to discuss it Persons were now calling for people to be born out of their communities, mm. but it also showed that there were still issues in terms of our understanding of people's rights and personhood. Mm -hmm. It also showed that we still have some pervasive myths and stereotypes. Myths? That yeah. Okay. There's still, still some... Still in 2018, if some oh, of those yeah. myths still exist today? Still mm. exist, still exist. Like what, what are some of those that you, you encounter? Or you've heard persons verbalize at some point? Well, one of them particularly is somehow that if you are positive, your life done. Oh. Yeah. And somehow that if you're positive, you do not have um, access to, you still don't have sexual and productive health needs. Mm. Um, another one is that, uh, this is one that I found funny, but it's very dangerous coming from some young people who felt that if you had certain types of sexual acts, mm -hmm. you could prevent the transmission of HIV. Okay. Yeah. And I was like, okay. okay. Yes. Uh, they're From also young people in particular? Yes, mm. young persons yes. in particular. One mm. particular person asked me that if I had um, a certain type of sex with my girlfriend, it means I won't have HIV, right? Mm. Yeah, and he believed that, and he, that is something that is being spread in his, in his particular school and area. There are people who still, and I was shocked hearing this. I thought this was something that was still confined to the history books, but persons still feel that having sex, some people still said, coming out of their mouths, that having sex with virgins. Mm. Uh, I did not know. <laughs> yeah, I, I would, uh, you know, would one thought, would have thought that in yes. 2018 that would have um, been dispelled what completely. What came out of the consultation was that people were hungry for information, mm -hmm. They welcomed information. Another significant thing that observed for me is that they wanted information to be shared early. In terms of what, Vaughan, what do you mean by early? Vaughan, I did not think that I would hear in a public consultation that people wanted access to information from minors starting from grade school. Okay. Person, we, they want persons to yes, the information to be made I, I mean, available to youngsters. Here. And ev from Montego Bay, we had it in Port Maria. Everybody said that we need to start education of our young people between from age five to six. This is what the public is saying. Okay. But they did not, they also reminded us that this does not relegate the rights of parents to the background. Mm. They also felt that parents still have a major role to play. Uh, that we should do more to inform parents and communities mm -hmm. and that as much as we bring the information to our young people, we should find ways to integrate more communities and parents into the response. Mm. So, so make like a holistic movement rather yeah. than just individual groups yes. of persons who are getting the information. Yeah. Now, Nicola, you raised something a while ago saying that the how things have morphed in Jamaica is that it's it's you now what, what you call a mixed epidemic in that there are certain um, groups pockets in the population. And pockets. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. How, how, what do you, what do you, where are those pockets? Or how have you categorized those pockets, essentially? So a person can have a better understanding of what you mean by that. Okay, so we, in the response, pride ourselves on having an evidence-based mm -hmm. um, response, meaning the necessary research mm -hmm. is done, and we use the data from our research processes to inform what we do. And our research has shown um, consistently that men who have sex with men, mm -hmm. um, they are primarily affected. Mm -hmm. Within the men who have sex with men, if you were to look at transgender mm -hmm. women, um, their rate of HIV is also higher than the general population. We give you an example. Among the general population, which is the ordinary Jamaican citizen, mm -hmm. the prevalence rate is esti estimated to be 1.7%. Now, if you put that in numbers, it would mean that for every 200 person, 
because you don't have one point, you right. don't have point seven of a person. At least two would be um, HIV positive. Right. Okay. The current data that we have for men who have sex with men um, reveal that uh, thirty-two okay. percent, the, the prevalence okay. rate so is that's as the high. Primary or that, that or that group with the highest incidence, so to speak. That the data show. Right. We are currently undertaking um, a new study, and mm -hmm. as those as that data becomes available, of course, we will be disseminating and sharing with the wider public. But um, for now, the data that we have reflect uh, this. Well, ladies um, and gentlemen, we just, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're here with representatives from the National National Family Planning Board. We're discussing the revision of the national uh, revision of the national HIV AIDS, AIDS um, policy. policy. Um, it seems to be getting a lot of very valuable, very insightful information. Just let me just take some time to big up some persons who have tuned in and sent us some questions, sent us some comments. Um, it's Jennifer Leslie Lopez. Thank you so much for your comment. Um, she's saying that she hopes the young people are paying attention. This information is very vital, uh, definitely so. Um, Miss Sasha Gay Rochester, thank you so much for your comment. Really appreciate that. Tatlin Witter, good evening to you too, although it's noon here. But thank you so much for your comment. Really appreciate that. All right. She I must mean, be in Russia. I, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but okay. So uh, let me get you um, to talk about the revision process. Where are we with that now and how is that going? So um, let me just correct some. Let me add something. Okay, um, sure. I would not want um, us to say that the heavy bur heaviest burden of HIV is right. amongst uh, men who right, have sex right, with men. Right. Um, that might force persons to, to kind yes. of you know not necessarily take their foot off the gas, so to speak. The yeah. the population we are still, um, as Nicola has rightly said, we are evidence based, mm -hmm. and so therefore we are conducting studies on the scope and the breadth of the MSM population in our mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. So until that is done, we can only say that generally um, we have been able successfully to bring the, pr the prevalence of HIV amongst the general population mm -hmm. from the highs that it was in the double digits mm, okay. to consistently below 2%. That's, that's outstanding. Okay? Um, that is within the overall population of mm -hmm. our country. Within that 2%, however, there is still, a, there is still that kernel of, uh, of populations that are more heavily impacted. Um, not to say that they represent the entire population, mm -hmm. but within that 2%, there's still a core population, sex workers, and we've been able to bring those prevalence down. Mm -hmm. But what is of significant is that yo young people and women. Mm. Women, they, okay. Yes. Based on the, um, we just did a recent, um, let me make sure I have the name correctly, the Knowledge, Attitude, Practice, and Behavior Survey mm -hmm. showed that we have worrying trends as it relates to the use of condoms amongst, uh, amongst our young persons. Mm -hmm. um, our, use, our recent epidata shows that um, in terms of new infections, young people are highly at risk. What, young people, in terms of what age range are you talking about? When you mentioned young people, are what? less than 21, yes, less, than less than 16, 21. or something like that? Yes, you're talking about young adolescent okay. population. Um, so when we go into the next round um, of our response in terms of our planning, we have now identified youth and adolescents as one of our key population, mm -hmm. men who have sex with men, uh, sex workers, transgender women, as has been pointed out. Mm -hmm. We must, but we must also look at the other vulnerable populations, persons in our penitentiaries and, and wards of the state. Oh, yes. uh, and we must definitely look at our general outreach mm -hmm. to, to our men as well. Um, multiple sex partners is something that is still a significant challenge and continues to be high. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned the myths that keep, keep right, right, that are right, pervasive right. and they keep re-emerging. Um, now, Going back to your question. Okay, I mean, uh, before I even go right back there, there's something that you mentioned that I wanted to, uh, yes. to, to discuss further. That um, that two percent. What would you say? I mean, I would imagine it's not necessarily as simple as a black and white thing. But what would you say is the primary reason that we're not able to get it down to zero? Now, I mean, we still have the challenges with the individual groups and so on. Now, is there a particular hurdle or a particular set of circumstances that? Our uh, factor that that makes it makes uh, makes us unable to get it down to zero. Um, there are a number of factors. Um, some of them are socioeconomic in nature, mm -hmm. so poverty is one. Mm -hmm. Some of them are behavioral. So Devon would have mentioned um, multiple partnerships, um, condom use. Mm -hmm. um, so although we've had many ads to say use a condom every time you have sex and use it consistently mm -hmm. um, for reasons. 
um, known to many Jamaicans. Right. Um, they say, well, I don't enjoy having sex in a condom, and therefore they'll take um, the risk. They'll take the risk. No, so, I mentioned um, poverty, mm-hmm. uh, high rate of unemployment, and I mentioned the behavioral, two of the behavioral issues, mm-hmm. and of course, stigma and discrimination remain the main barriers mm. to the reduction or the elimination of the HIV. Okay, so a person can contract and choose not to necessarily seek help because they're afraid. They're they afraid to go and get help because of this thing. Plus, I mean, mm-hmm. I am not at risk because HIV is for those persons. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. The othering kind the of. The other. other. Right. So I don't need to know my status because mm-hmm. I only have sex with Tougher, tougher people. Uh, I have one partner who yeah. is, who is never who would never yeah. be unfaithful. That yeah. kind of thing. Uh, uh, or even if I have multiple partners, I know that person because they go to church and they're good people, mm-hmm. and therefore I can trust them. Mm. It is, as we said, it is this this or cultural beliefs and attitudes sometimes can be harmful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we therefore need to understand that HIV is not something that is seen on a person's forehead. Right. Uh, but it's something that you can only know if you do regular tests and you get to to develop regular and healthy habits, right. including screening. No, um, you uh, once you're sexually we, active. Before we go on to the revision process again, and I, I mean, as you mentioned, that young people, young adolescents, are the ones that are surprisingly showing you the more are showing an increased amount of incidences. In particular, what what would you attribute for them? Is it um, ignorance? Is it just experimentation? Is it just you know just feeling like young and vin- young and invincible that kind of thing? Well, I have a thirteen year old, mm. and um, I saw him just mushroom. Literally, he grew. He spurted from this little innocent little boy to now. He's saying he's singing the songs and he's moving around. He's going in front of the mirror. He thinks he's the, the world's hottest guy. And I think my 30-year-old is indicative of what happens to any of most okay. young people, of which who I was not, not mm-hmm. too long ago. Mm-hmm. We're invincible. Okay. We're the hottest thing on the block. Right. You know, my parents provide me with resources, send me to the good schools. Therefore, I am immune. Immune to, to any possible yeah. threat for anything like yes. that. Yes. And also, if I am learning about my nerves, finding out about my body, mm. understanding what an what an erection means mm. and what can happen with it. Right. Um, it is so difficult. Uh, uh, and we have um, behavior change specialists and National Family Planning Board that specializes in these things. Mm-hmm. To, to bridge that gap for young people, that, that, that sense of invincibility right. is also a vulnerability. Right, definitely. They and need to so know that. Our work is to give, you know, build the capacity of young people to come with ways in which they can tra- to, to walk that narrow path. Okay. Where in which you can still have fun. Nobody's raiding on, your, raiding on your parade. But you this have is not to be responsible. Thing. You have <laughs> but, to be responsible. But responsibility. Yes. Right. Um, which is why I'm glad we're on social media so the young persons can get I would yeah. just, just look in the camera and tell them that you're not young. You're not. Re- reinforce that for me. Invincible. Yes. Look <laughs> in the camera and tell them they're not young and you're not invincible. You are young. Well, you are young. Okay. You're hot, mm-hmm. but you're not invincible. Um, really? Because young people, oh, come on, we're young. Yeah. And you have all you have all the best muscles. Come on, if my son looks at me and says, you old man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and have to take it. But my role and our role as any responsible person under the mandate of the HIV policy is to find a way in which we can um, build up the, the empower young people to make healthy decisions. Right. Really, it's about that. I suppose it's that and suppose that there's all. I mean. Let me, let go no, no, I go. just would like to use the opportunity to say that at the National Family Planning Board, we can offer parents and young people right. um, assistance mm-hmm. if they are struggling with these issues, if they would call the Majropa Counseling Service, yes. and I just give the number 968 1627 to 32, mm-hmm. and you can um, place those questions that uh, maybe as a parent you are finding it difficult to address with your teenager, mm-hmm. and uh, as a teenager, um, over 16 right. or so, you can um, get right, so the kind of information. Uh, you're being asked for you to re- repeat the number and the service. 
1627-32, Majopa Counseling Service. Okay, wonderful. All right, and so don't forget, of course, your 876 now. Well, oh, yes. <laughs> definitely. Of course. Definitely. Uh, All right, so let's shift a little and focus on the revision itself and where mm. we are with that. Okay. Uh, since 2015, um, our team at the National Family Planning Board through my unit, we have been spearheading the the part of the instructions coming through the Ministry of Health for to conduct public consultations uh, to, to revise the policy. Mm -hmm. uh, where we are now is that we have done consultations to to inform the development of of, of the second draft of mm -hmm. the policy uh, that is being actually being pulled together now. Uh, sometime at the end of this month, we will start an, a, a renewed process of consultation so that we can get persons further in, input into that, what we will hope to be the, f the third and the final, well, the third draft. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hope to wrap this entire process uh, in advance of August. Mm -hmm. uh, what is required of us in any policy development process is that we develop a, a concept, we develop the policy as well as a note that the, that the, the Human Resource Committee and other committees of cabinet will be re re review mm -hmm. for cabinet's final approval. All right. Yes. But All before right. we move from that, I would just like to say that um, when cabinet gave us permission to revise the, the policy in 2015, its stipulation for the public con consultations um, was necessary because mm -hmm. a policy is not just a document to sit down. Mm -hmm. And we really want the Jamaican populace to, to feel out. that they had an input and had a say in, um, mm -hmm. do in developing the policy. So in the first iteration of the consultations, we went island-wide mm -hmm. in 2016. Mm -hmm. And then just recently, April to May of this year, we did four regional validation meetings because we would have um, revised the policy using the 2016 feedback. Mm -hmm. And now we took it back to them to say, was this what you said? Mm -hmm. And are there still gaps that you would like addressed? And they pretty much have said, you know, some of the issues that Devon would have mentioned earlier and asked us to simplify, which is a challenge with many policy documents. Okay. Simplify some of the language and bring it back to us. All right. So let me... As we move towards our close, there are two questions I have. Um, one, do you find that there is any opposition to your efforts to, to the efforts to, 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 to make HIV AIDS um, access to treatment, access to services and so on? Is there opposition to this? Because, you know, there are many persons who believe that these persons brought this on themselves, for example. And so mm -hmm. therefore, why are we enabling them? Do you find there's opposition in that kind of regard? That opposition is... If you were to do a comparison mm -hmm. out of 10, if you heard two, you heard eight who, would, who, who have, are now openly rejecting that position. Okay. Uh, I would recall when I first came to the response some years ago, mm -hmm. uh, you'd have people who would say just what you just said, mm -hmm. and those comments were allowed to, to settle and to remain there in the room. What came out of the consultations at work, it wasn't us, the technical people who were standing up mm -hmm. to respond to that of, of, to that position, mm -hmm. but it was the people themselves <laughs> okay. who got up and said, no, no okay. that's, Very good. it can't look at it like that. We must remember, one, that it's not, it, I mean, apart from the fact that human beings deserve to have health care. Right. And it is the responsibility of the government to provide health care and adequate health care that is of a certain standard and quality. Mm -hmm. But it also would be against every single common sense principle to allow persons to be exposed, for to allow families to be broken up. Mm -hmm. And then what, because what came out of those conversations were the links to employers, see? The links to the church and the community, uh, the links to school the links to the industry. So HIV in itself is not something that is just a standalone on an island, mm -hmm. but it affects people's lives. Right, that's true. And so that is coming out of these. People are seeing that, that this is a life issue. There were some concessions, and where we, I must say, people are, of course, mindful of the resources that are available. So what came out of the consultations that a persons are promoting responsible behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're promoting means testing, that if a person can afford certain things, etc. So 
So those kind of nuanced debates are going on now All within right. our population. So the general. Mindful of the resource distribution and availability. But where our population is now, it's far away, far removed no, from that kind of thinking. Far removed from that kind of thinking, right. thankfully. thankfully. And we're not going right. to go there, go return right. to that space. All right. So my final question before I give you the, give both of you the opportunity to make your appeal for consultations and support as well for the, for mm -hmm. the efforts of the, um, the National Family Planning Board. Yes. Um, my final question is, what are we doing right? What are the things that we're getting right in Jamaica insofar as providing treatment to persons living with HIV, AIDS, and so on? If I may, um, mm -hmm. one of the very good things is that persons are more willing to be tested. Mm -hmm. And therefore, right now, um, it is estimated that 88% of Jamaicans know their HIV positive status. Mm -hmm. However, there's still a gap where men are concerned. They do not readily come forward um, for testing, mm -hmm. but there are interventions on the way to improve that as well. But coming from where I started in the response about um, say eight or 10 years ago, mm -hmm. when it was estimated that 50% of persons did not know their HIV status, rolling out our mobile testing services across Jamaica through the four regional health authorities, and of course at the National Family Planning Board, where I'm a proud member of the staff, um, we really, really have done well in that regard. And there are many other um, areas I'm sure Devon would want to add. Okay. I really don't want to add anything more than what because yeah, okay. like she has said so well. But I have to put on my director's hat mm. and say that we have clear professional strategies okay. that set out the clear actions that sets out responsibilities and a role, not only for government agencies, mm -hmm but for, for civil society. Um, in our response, it is not government-led. It's not only led by the National Family Planning Board and the Ministry of Health. Uh, we're proud to say as Jamaica that we have very active non-governmental organizations in response. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really good for our country. Uh, we are also have clear, we have articulated the needs and concerns of populations who otherwise will be ignored. Mm -hmm. Nicola has, re, uh, has referred to them earlier. Uh, we, we have a rights-based approach. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's good. We, because you cannot be speaking of HIV and AIDS and be neglecting people. Right. You know? Of course. It is like, ign it's like that ignoring the elephant sense. in the room. Right. What sense would that make? Right. And, uh, and definitely a third, a, a third thing that we should be very, very proud of is what we have built around our access to medication. Mm -hmm. um, the mere fact that we have maintained a commitment to providing um, antiretroviral therapy mm -hmm. to all who need it in our country, and that commitment is going into the next decade. Proud of that. Okay, that's, uh, that's exceptional. Um, I th like I said, I'm just gonna give. I'm gonna give both of you the last chance to just basically let persons know what you're doing, how they can help you to make this um, this revision a uh, very informative and informed process and a participatory process, so that they can lend a hand and make it their document, not just so much something that is done by the family. I will board. let. Um, I will give my colleague. I want you to. Uh, I will give my colleague camera. Nicola a chance, but I would like to use this opportunity, um, Nicola, um, to, to thank the communities that have come out into this process. I would especially like to thank the persons at the, the SDC. Uh, the SDC stands for Social the Development, Social Commission. Development, Social Development Commission. Uh -huh. My friends at the Social Development Commission, the various people from the various groups and youth arms and the various community groups, Thank you so much because it made us, it really entrenched and it really enforced the belief that HIV is not a health thing. It is not a, only a certain type of people thing, it's a community thing. Um, it, I would also like to, to remind persons that the policy is on our website at the National Family Planning Board. Mm -hmm. um, you can go on to our website. And we have a nice form there in which you can give us your input. It's still ongoing. We will welcome mm -hmm. you. And thirdly, as you review the document, the document is, as Nicola has rightly said, is not, the f is not final. Mm -hmm. And that means final in terms of final drafts and also final in terms of what are the priorities articulated. There might be something that we have not put in there that you know should be a major priority for the next couple of years of our policy. Let us know. 
Okay. Nicola? And to speak to the NFPB in general, the National Family Planning Board, I would just like to remind Jamaicans that the NFPB is committed to reducing teenage pregnancy even further. We're currently promoting dual protection or dual method use. That is where you use a barrier method, a male or female condom, along with a contraceptive method, the pill, the injection, um, and any other, the IUD, interuterine um, device, as well as we continue to enable Jamaicans to plan their families uh, responsibly because even after 19, uh, how many years, 40 years, two is still better than too many. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you so much to both of you. It is time for us to wrap. Thanks to everyone who tuned into our discussion, especially those of you who sent in comments. Really appreciate that. And if you sent in a question and we didn't get to answer it in our discussion, not to worry. We will be going through afterwards and we'll be answering questions. And if, if it's something that we can't answer ourselves, we'll be all too happy to put you on to our friends here so they can give you some assistance. Remember, our audience plays a major part in our show. If there's anyone that you'd like to see in studio, let us know and we'll try our best to have that person in studio as soon as possible. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at Jamaica Information Service to see who will be in studio next. We do this every Thursday live on Facebook. I've been your host, Vaughn Davis, and this has been Studio 58A Live. Thank you for joining us, and please have a good day. Mm -hmm.